Although people have identified with the territories on which they live for thousands of years, it has only been during the last two centuries that the world has been divided into nation-states with distinct and reinforced borders. The establishment of national borders worldwide has left numerous peoples stateless and divided. One such example are the Uyghurs, a Turkic Muslim people who have long practiced agriculture, animal husbandry, and trading in the oases of Central Asia. Over the last 100 years, a number of borders in the region have separated the Uyghur people and left them stateless. First, they were situated in the frontier between Russian and Chinese spheres of influence. Later, the same boundary divided them between Soviet and Chinese states. Presently, they live in several of the new nation states of the former USSR, as well as in the People's Republic of China. Of the roughly 8 million Uyghurs in the world today, 300,000 live in the former Soviet Union, two-thirds of whom are in Kazakhstan. The majority, over seven and a half million, live in China's northwestern borderlands. When colonizing this area in the 18th century, the Chinese named it Xinjiang, or the New Dominion. Uyghurs reject this name, calling the region Uyghurstan, or Eastern Turkestan, titles that evoke the ancient Uyghur empire that once ruled there and emphasize the area's Turkic cultural heritage. It is the hope of the Uyghur diaspora that this area will one day be home to an internationally recognized Uyghur nation state. It is this dream that unites the divided Uyghur nation, the hope of replacing the borders that separate them as a people with their own borders that will define their place in the world. Despite the establishment of a formal border between Russian and Chinese domains in Central Asia during the 19th century, Uyghurs living close to the border have migrated back and forth many times. In the 1880s, many were allowed to leave China for Russian-ruled Kazakhstan. Then in the 1920s and 30s, Uyghurs fled the Soviet Union for Chinese-controlled Xinjiang. The largest cross-border migration in this century took place between 1953 and 1963 when tens of thousands of Uyghurs fled to Soviet Kazakhstan to escape the economic and political turmoil that followed the Chinese Revolution. In the midst of this mass migration, diplomatic relations between China and the Soviet Union worsened and border clashes between the two states led to an increased fear of war. As a result, the Sino-Soviet border was closed in 1963 and cross-border contact between Uyghurs ceased for over two decades. This video is about the experiences of three Uyghurs who came to Kazakhstan from China's Xinjiang province in the 1950s and 60s. Tilvaldi Korbanov, Imar Bek Maksimov, and Dilia Pyruz Hajia Jievna. These three Uyghurs settled in Kazakhstan's capital city of Almaty, which is only 200 kilometers from the Chinese border. However, they were cut off from their relatives and culture in Xinjiang and forced to adapt to a Soviet social system and a Soviet Uyghur culture. Although they have lived in the People's Republic of China, the Soviet Union, and now the Republic of Kazakhstan, 
These three Uyghurs define themselves primarily in relation to the homeland they envision in Uyghurstan. In 1956, a new political movement appeared in China called Sing Openly. It was meant to train native cadres, yet another political movement. We openly sang, said everything. In the end, we are condemned as opponents of Maoism, as nationalists, and as enemies of the state. We spend a year being condemned. Each morning they start again. What did you say? Who are you against? The politics of China are like that. Through what they call education, they eventually repress everybody. I went to my mother for advice. She said, son, if your head is working, you'll leave. Go to the Soviet Union. I applied for the visas, and on Thursday, the 1st of June, 1961, my two daughters, my wife and I, crossed the border into the Soviet Union. In 1952, my father and mother split up. After my mother's brothers were shot for political reasons, my dad left my mother with five kids. My mother brought us up by herself. Then, when I was studying in the sixth grade, we left for the USSR. At that time, my father was in prison. With my mother, my sister, and my father's son from a former marriage, my father was married three times. I left for the Soviet Union. <laughs> My parents were born Soviet citizens. They used to live in Asi, in the Chalik region. During the repression in the 1930s, life was difficult in Kazakhstan. Rich people were accused of being kulaks and were arrested. My parents also had many problems. So to find a better life, they left for Kulja in Xinjiang and started to live there. Then in 1955, when I was young, about seven years old, we returned to the Soviet Union. At that time, there were good relations between the Soviet Union and China, and all former Soviet citizens in China were called upon to return to this side of the border. When we crossed the border, they checked us very, very closely. Three soldiers inspected me. Then medics gave my sisters medicine. In total, we were at the border for three days. After inspecting us for three days, they let us go on. When we got to Yarkent, they quickly put us on a train to our next destination. We didn't see anything. We just got on the train and left. When we crossed the border, 
We went through customs and inspection on the Chinese side. Then we stopped at another place for the Soviet customs. There they checked our bags and they asked us, do you have opium, gold, dangerous things, and so on. We didn't have anything, so they let us go on. Next, we arrived in Yarkent, the first town near the border. There, they made us take baths, and they disinfected our clothing. Only after a couple hours did they send us off on our own way. That's how things went at the border. We came to the Zaharsky region in the Karaganda Oblast, and as soon as we got off the train, they welcomed us. They gave us flour, milk, butter, kumis, all kinds of things. In China, there had been a famine, so when we saw white bread, we were very happy. But there was a strong feeling of distress at the realization that we had left our homeland and our relatives. Of course, it was sad. Yeah, we have a lot of relatives there, and we often correspond with them. Before, when you had just come here in the 1950s, could you correspond with your relatives at that time? Nah, we couldn't write letters to each other for 25 years. Not only that, but we didn't even dare to say we had relatives in China. When I filled out the documents to join the Communist Party, let's see, I think it was in 1973, I said that I didn't have relatives there. Those who had relatives in China were not allowed into the party. Not only were we afraid to communicate with them, we were too scared to even talk about our relatives in Xinjiang. On April 28th, after we had been in Kazakhstan for two days, the head of the agricultural collective came to us and said that we two eldest had to work to support the family. Mother cried and said, how can they work? They're still too young. But my sister and I replied, let's try and see what happens. Since we started working right away, my sister and I were not able to study. We didn't take any classes. However, since we worked well, we were never poor. We never refused to work. We tried to do whatever they asked us to. But neither my sister nor I were lucky in our personal lives. We were not able to find much happiness. <laughs> Before, during the Soviet period, when we first arrived in Kazakhstan, we had problems with the local Uyghurs. They said, ah, you're Chinese. We had a lot of conflicts. But now, we have good relations, because our children, our sons and daughters, have married each other. We've mixed. Now the local Uyghurs have come to like us, because of our traditions. They say they learn Uyghur traditions from us. Of course, because during the communist period, 
They forgot everything. They didn't go to the mosques, didn't gather for the Meshrep, the traditional gatherings, or anything like that. Then we came, relations gradually got better between us, and now we have a good union. All that name calling, you're a dirty Chinese, you're a Soviet piece of dirt, that's over. <laughs> After the Sino-Soviet border reopened in 1985, Imar Beck, Tilvaldi, and Dilia Pyruz were permitted to visit Xinjiang for the first time in over 20 years. The homeland to which they returned was neither the one they had left nor the one they had imagined in exile. The capital city of Urumqi, remembered by many Soviet Uyghurs as a Uyghur city, is now predominantly Han Chinese. Most of China's investment in Xinjiang has been concentrated in this Chinese-dominated city. Uyghur population centers such as Kashgar, Hotan, and Kulja, where the three Uyghurs in this video once lived, are less developed and remain much poorer. Let's see, when was it, uh, 1988? When the border opened up again. Well, anyways, that's when relatives started to visit us again. Then in 1991, I went to Xinjiang and stayed there for 71 days. My wife, daughters, and grandchildren all went to visit our relatives. In total, I have about 400 relatives there. They live poorly. My brother has two daughters, both teachers. They do all right, but his sons are all without work. They're very, very poor. The Chinese population is taking over, so the Uyghurs have no work. <laughs> After Perestroika started, the road to Uyghurstan opened up, and we renewed contact with our relatives. Then, in 1991, my wife and I went to visit relatives. We first went to Urumqi, then to Kulja, and finally to my home village, Murat. We saw the Uyghurs there, and we were very happy to see our relatives again. But when we saw how they lived, it made us very upset. They have to work so hard. There, all of the men have to work on the land. And everybody says that they live better now than before. Education is also a big problem. My cousin's two daughters, they don't study. When one daughter finished the fourth or fifth grade, she didn't want to study anymore. She didn't think it would help her to find work. I managed to talk her into studying further, but their older daughter didn't study at all. And the young boys just hang out on the street all day. They drink, smoke hashish, play cards, and shoot billiards. The first time I went back, it was very emotional for me. Of course, I was born there, I grew up there. What can you do? It is my mother's land, my land. I met all of the relatives I didn't know. I realized it was my land. How did you find your relatives? Were they as they had been in the 1960s? No, they were different. They had fallen in spirit. 
In Soydin, I saw my older sister, and I didn't recognize her. She had become so poor. They lived very poorly, and they were afraid of the state. They couldn't do anything. On my first trip to Xinjiang, I went by plane to Urumqi. When I got there, I was so happy to be in my homeland. Everywhere we looked, on all of the buildings, the signs were in Uyghur as well as Chinese. When I saw the signs in Uyghur, my heart swelled up. I thought, here, there are a lot of Uyghurs. There were Uyghurs everywhere we went in Urumqi, in Kulja, in the bazaars and restaurants, and everybody speaks Uyghur. When I saw this, I thought, yes, here is my homeland. It made me happy. It gave me great inspiration. That first time you went to the other side of the border, did you feel at home? When I went there, well, I felt a little out of place. You see, when you go to visit people, you can't immediately be part of their world, even if they are relatives. They welcome you, but after you are reunited with relatives, what is there to do? The reunion with relatives inspires you and makes you feel happy, but Xinjiang is no longer our home. When you live somewhere else for a long time, that place becomes home. We were only in Xinjiang for a month before we became homesick for Kazakhstan. That's where our children are. That's where our home is. Our hearts were at home. The first time you went there, did you do any trading? Yes, the first time I traded a little. At that time, the government didn't allow it, but I had brought some things from Kazakhstan to give out to my relatives in Xinjiang. Then, with the money we had just exchanged to dollars, I bought some things I could sell back in Kazakhstan. Just a little, not much. That first time, I brought back shawls and adidas from Kulja. Shortly after the reopening of the Sino-Soviet border, Tilvaldi, Dilia, Pyrus, and Imarbek faced another monumental change, the fall of the Soviet Union and the collapse of its infrastructure. Without state-secured employment, they were forced to find alternative sources of income. Capitalizing on their kin relations and experiences in Xinjiang, they now procure goods from China and sell them in Almaty, Kazakhstan. They sell their wares wholesale at Almaty's central Barahulka market. About a 20-minute bus ride from the center of the city, the Barahulka is located in a northwest suburb of Almaty known as Saria Vastoka, or the Dawn of the East. In this large bazaar, merchants from both sides of the border can purchase large shipping containers that serve both as locked storage units by night and makeshift stores by day. Despite the rapid growth of this bazaar, most Uyghurs, including the three featured in this video, make minimal profits as middlemen in the cross-border trade. The majority of money is made by those who produce the goods. Not only are most of the businessmen producing these goods Han Chinese and not Uyghur, but most of the products are made in the special economic zones of southern China, rather than in Xinjiang.
Why do we sell Chinese goods if we are against the Chinese? Yes, they have taken our homeland. We are only thinking about politics. Of course we wouldn't sell Chinese goods. But we are now in a period of transition, and our lives have become very difficult. We have to think first about feeding our families. In order to survive through these times and make lives for ourselves, we have to sell goods no matter what state they are from, no matter what group they are connected to. I've only recently started trading, but it isn't going well. There isn't much profit yet. This is new for me. Before, I worked in a Soviet store as the head of inventory. But with the inflation during perestroika, my salary was no longer enough to survive on. That's when I decided to start trading. The trade economy only really started in full force after the fall of the Soviet Union and since the creation of new independent states here as a result of the economic chaos that followed. With the opening of the border with China around the same time, everybody started concentrating on the buying and selling of Chinese goods. Now, our whole life is based on that. Why? Because nobody has money, and Chinese goods are cheap. That's why everybody is trading. <laughs> I sit at the bazaar and sell goods myself because those who buy wholesale go to the bazaar. That's why I sit at the bazaar from morning to night. Then I come home and do my household chores. It's difficult for women. We can do housework, state work, but trading is tough for women. I'm now 47 years old. My former strength is gone. I have already worked 30 years for the state. Trading is much harder. When we go abroad to buy goods, we Soviet women also have to physically carry heavy sacks and bags over the border. The men think it's funny and laugh at us. For us, it is very tough. Those in Xinjiang tell us what is selling at a good price. As quick as we can sell the goods, we let them know, and they'll send more to us. We get goods as often as once or twice a week. However, if one item is selling quickly, we call China and tell them that we have a special client. Then they'll send the goods within two or three days. Now we have good contacts in China, and better transportation is available. We work together to bring goods from China, and they sell well here in Kazakhstan. I don't only sell in Almaty. I sell in Karaganda, in Jezkazan, and in Siberia. Russians even come from Siberia to buy goods from me at my house. It isn't bad. There isn't always a profit. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. But that's how I feed my children now. When you go to Xinjiang to buy goods, do you work with your relatives? My relatives help me out a lot. They are good traders. I get goods through them, and if they don't have goods, I get them at the bazaar.
I get most of my goods in Urumqi. Since most of my relatives live in Kulja and don't have any contacts in Urumqi, they can't help me, so I don't work with my relatives there. I do, however, work with my relatives here in Kazakhstan. We go to China together to get goods and then sell them here. We don't know Chinese and most of the stores in Urumqi are owned by Chinese. So we get young Uyghurs to work as middlemen between us and the Chinese merchants. They're young kids, 16, 18, 20 years old. They help us translate. And you know, there's no other work for those poor kids. Before, the Barahoka was open only on Saturday and Sunday. The rest of the time it was closed. Then they opened up the Chinese Bazaar and set up a few shipping containers in 1993. At that time, a container cost about $100. Now they cost anywhere from $3,000 to $3,500 for an empty container. To rent the space after buying the container, it costs another 6,000 tenge, or $100 a month. Soon it may be 9,000, or $150. It's a good setup for the government. It's also a good deal for the small companies that are selling the containers. That's why the people in charge of the bazaar started thinking and expanded. When the border with Uyghurstan first opened, there was a lot of profit to be made. At that time, there were stricter limits on transporting dollars across the border. For example, in 1992, when we went to Xinjiang, for each person, the government exchanged $180 at 6 rubles and 50 kopecks per dollar. But with that money, you could buy a lot, bring it back here, and sell it for a large profit. Now we have to bring a lot more money to make our trips worthwhile. We bring four, five, even ten thousand dollars, but the profit is usually only ten to fifteen percent, and sometimes not even that. From the sandals I just bought, I'm not even making a one percent profit. Look at these sandals. You probably couldn't wear them for more than a week. The stitches on the inside are already coming out. The whole shipment was defective. What can you do? I'll be happy just to break even. It is very difficult to survive now. Every day we take two bags of goods to the bazaar just so that we can buy bread and tea for our children. Nothing is selling, so we just sit here. Hey, Imarbekaka, the goods aren't selling, so you're sleeping in the container. Nobody wants to buy these cheap Chinese goods. As the trade in Chinese goods at Alma Ati's central Barahoka grows, it is becoming more competitive, often straining the relations between Uyghurs across the border. However, there is an emergent culture that transcends the economic transactions and political border that stand between the Uyghur people of Kazakhstan and China. Now there are many Uyghurs from China trading at the bazaar and living temporarily in Alma Ati. Some have even opened restaurants specializing in the cuisine of Xinjiang. For Dilia Pyrus, Imar Beck, and Tilvaldi, the bazaar now produces daily encounters with the people and culture of the homeland they left over 20 years ago. In these encounters, Uyghurs from both sides of the border are forced to reevaluate Uyghur culture and what it means to be a Uyghur. The 
Uyghurs from China have no work. The young can't study. That's why all the young Uyghurs from there come to Kazakhstan to work. And you can't refuse help to your relatives. We now have two relatives from China living with us. One just left for home and will come back on the 20th of this month. The other one is here now. One has four children, the other has three. They came here to make money in order to raise their kids. I am their boss. They bring goods from China. I look after the business, and we sit here and sell the goods together. Uyghurs from that side of the border come here for one, two, even three years to live and trade. We are not able to do that because we have families, and we won't leave them. Those from China, they are able to come here while their wives sit at home and provide for the children. It is the men there who make the money and bring it home to their families. We are not able to do that in Kazakhstan. We don't have that kind of situation. Why are you going on about how good we live? I'll whack you in the head for speaking such lies. It's good, not that bad. Where? Yes, for us it isn't that bad, for you and me. But there are thousands in the villages there who live poorly. We know that, brother. Yeah, it's not bad for you, but for your uncle living in the village? Thousands of people live like that. Meat costs 25 yuan now. Think about that. Anybody who doesn't think about their people is an empty person. Isn't that true, brother? True. We have a lot of worries, my friend. Film away. <laughs> Where are you from? I am from Kulja. My name is Tudahun. I have already been here nine months. I haven't been home once. At home, I have a lot of problems. What are conditions like there? Bad. Uyghurs live poorly there. There is no work. I don't have a father or a mother. I am alone. I don't have sisters or brothers. I have three children. That is why I've come here to sell goods. In Xinjiang, there is no work, no business to do. All the business belongs to the Chinese. We have nothing. They murder us. They shoot us poor Uyghurs. They shoot young, young boys. We are poor. We are forced to steal. We pickpocket. We become bandits. A person with no money can't be a person. If there were better conditions, we could work in factories. If the state would give us money, we'd work eight hours. We'd go to work in the morning wearing clean clothes, buy clean clothing for our families. But now, everything in Xinjiang's expensive. Meat is expensive. Clothes are expensive. There are lots and lots of people. Is it better for you now, here in Kazakhstan? Now, it is a little bit better here, for us. We can sell a little here. Our pockets see money. Our souls get some rest. The Xinjiang Uyghurs are surprised at us Soviet Uyghurs. They say that we drink too much, we've forgotten our traditions and customs, that we have no religion. That's them. But now we are mixing, and relations are getting better between us. How are your relations with the Uyghurs of Kazakhstan? Now things are good. They are not bad. They are gradually starting to learn from us. They had become Russian, but now they are starting to mix with us. They're changing for the better. How about in religion? In religion, they are getting better now. Do you go to prayer here? Yes. Where? Here? In Zarya Vostoka? Yes, here in Zarya Vostoka. They have a big mosque here.
They influence us in many respects, especially in religion. Those who come here from Xinjiang are very religious. They tell us about Islam. We have started to unite with them under the banner of Islam. Now, many Soviet Uyghurs practice religion, read their prayers five times a day, go to the mosque. Many even go on the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca. No, it's not the influence of Uyghurs from China. We started to practice religion when the government gave us the right to. We returned to our religion all by ourselves. My son decided on his own to study the Quran. Now he reads the Quran and prays. He himself decided to learn. A 17-year-old boy. Those from Xinjiang all go to prayer every Friday. Not many of ours go. I myself don't go, because I never did that before. Understand? I know everything, everything. When there is a Muslim holiday, Hait, Ayam, Ramadan, Qurban, I read the Quran. But I'm not used to the other practices yet. Culturally, we also influence them a lot. Why, you ask? Because Uyghur culture has been suppressed in China. But now, they are coming here. They work with us, and we are mixing. We take all the good aspects of each other's cultures, and we leave the bad parts behind. <laughs> They are suppressed politically. My nephew, who lives here, I call to him and say, come here, let's talk. If I say something about politics, he'll leave. He is scared to be filmed for television today. You ask why? Because in Xinjiang, it is not allowed to speak about the freedom of our homeland in eastern Turkestan. We are raising that question here in Turkey and in other foreign countries. There, if they even discover our newspaper, Yangi Hayot, find it in his home, the Chinese will immediately put him in jail. Why? Because the Chinese are oppressors. They don't want to lose Xinjiang. Understand? They don't want to give us independence. They think Xinjiang is their new land. Koglaymiz düşmenle seddi çenige Kalmadı şakkı endi bizlerde Yaşsın yaşlısın azat Türküstan Atlandık her ayal azatlık için Yaşsın yaşlısın azat Türküstan while the emerging cross-border trade between Kazakhstan and China is allowing Uyghurs from both countries to negotiate a common national culture that transcends international borders, most Uyghurs feel this is not enough. They still remain adamant about the need for a Uyghur nation state that demarcates their homeland. As middlemen in a risky and tenuous trade between two states, neither of which they feel represent them, Imar Beck, Tilvaldi, and Dilia Pai Ruz have particularly strong feelings about the need for a Uyghur nation state. Yes, we say we need sovereignty. They must give us back our Xinjiang. We say that we need our land, that the Chinese must leave. We say that we will die for our land. But we don't have any strength. What can we do? We plead with people, 
write letters to the United Nations. I don't know if it does any good. But, as we say, you have to work for your homeland to be proud of it. The history of the Uyghurs is ancient and great. We aren't a bad people. We are just asking for our own future. Will that future be given to us or not? Who knows? The most important thing for the Uyghurs is to get our homeland back. The Mongols in Outer Mongolia only number one million, but they have their own state. There are states in Latin America and Europe with only 400,000 people, or even 40,000 people. Therefore, the main goal of Uyghurs for Xinjiang is to create an independent Eastern Turkestan. There is no other goal. Me, for example, even if you try to hang me, I will say we need Xinjiang. That is not Chinese land. It is Eastern Turkestan land. It is Uyghur land. <laughs> In my opinion, every people should have their own state. Everybody says, if the Communist Party of China falls apart, we should have our own state. One day, there will be independence in Xinjiang. As we say, God's reach is long. Nobody thought that the Soviet Union would fall apart, but the Soviet government fell. And when it fell, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan all received independence. When China falls, we will have independent governments in Tibet, Inner Mongolia, and in Uyghurstan. Like most Uyghurs in Kazakhstan, Tilvaldi, Imar Bek, and Dilia Pyruz all agree on the importance of establishing a Uyghur nation state in Xinjiang. However, apprehensive about the culture and life they have found on their return visits to Xinjiang, they are less united on the question of whether they would return to their homeland if an independent Uyghur state were to exist there. If there is independence in Xinjiang, the Uyghurs from Kazakhstan will go there. Everybody will go. Not just us. We will bring our children, too. Why? Everybody should have their own land. The Kazakhs, Uzbeks, and Kyrgyz said they needed their own land. We Uyghurs also want our own place and our own society. If we say something here that others don't like, the Kazakhs ask, are you a Chinese Uyghur? They'll say we are Chinese anyway. So I answer, yes, I'm a Chinese Uyghur. That wouldn't happen if we had our own place. Every nationality needs its own land. That would be good. If Uyghurstan becomes free, will Uyghurs from Kazakhstan go there to live? In my opinion, the point is not whether Uyghurs will go there. Why, you ask? The word Uyghurstan means that we have a mother and a father. 
we have a place in the world. If there is a Uyghur stand, it will be a great thing, not just for our Uyghurs, but for Uyghurs of Turkey, America, and other countries. Why? Because we will have a homeland, and the government there will treat all Uyghurs everywhere the same. Now we don't have a homeland. We are without a mother or a father. How do people look upon such children? If an orphan asks for something, nobody's going to give it to him. But if a child whose father is a government official asks for water, any person will bring it to him. Why? Because his father is an official connected to the state. Your own government works the same way. If I had a state in Uyghurstan, my wishes would be fulfilled here. Now I am a person without a state. Nobody pays attention to me. Nobody listens to me. I'm not saying that we are treated badly in Kazakhstan, but if we had a state elsewhere, we'd live better here in Kazakhstan a lot more opportunities would be open to us. Therefore, in the future, for the Uyghur people, for the nation, we need a state. If there is independence there, who knows what will happen? Kazakhstan has invited Kazakhs from all over the world to live in Kazakhstan. I don't know. Some will go, others will continue to live here as immigrants. Here it hasn't been bad for us. They gave me an apartment, they gave me work, they give me a pension now. If I leave, I can say I'm in my homeland. But if I stay, I can continue my life here. Who knows? But still, our homeland must be free. <laughs> At the time this video was completed, the Uyghur's homeland was still a part of the People's Republic of China. Imar Beck, Tilvaldi, and Dilia Pyrus were still trading at Alma Tea's Baraholka market and waiting for the establishment of a Uyghurstan. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.